So I wanted to start with Aristotle. You were talking about Aristotle in your presentation and the classic ex experiments he did. And why Aristotle still resonates today when you look at embryo development, the classic experiments he did. Um, it still, Aristotle re resonates because the experiments are still relevant. They were way ahead of their time. To imagine uh, coming up with the idea of dissecting chick embryos in the fourth century BCE and concluding that uh, developmental timing is important and that perhaps there's a conservation between uh, chickens and humans, it was such a huge leap. Mm -hmm. Aristotle, you have to admire that it appears to come out of almost nowhere. Now when we look at that, uh, those set, that set of experiments, it's also important because it laid the groundwork for something that we call the principle of universality, that there are universal traits across all species. And that principle has really dominated science from uh, the 18th or 19th century to now, where, and it's the basis for looking at flies and worms and mice and frogs and all kinds of different species and saying, therefore, we may understand humans. You also said, and you just said again, timing is important. It yeah. is fundamental. And, yeah. uh, and talk more about that. Timing is fundamental and why it's so critical, Cer mm -hmm. certainly, especially in the first few days of gestation. Yeah. You know, as I've looked at, uh, I'm a human geneticist by training, and very often we would find a gene, we'd knock it out, and if it... Uh, didn't cause cell death or the organism to die like the mouse, it was considered that perhaps that gene isn't important. And perhaps as I'm getting older as a scientist, what I've seen is that you knock things out and very often you subtly change, like a rheostat uh, is turned, you change uh, traits subtly. And I think that's more realistic about of, uh, explanation for why we get diseases and why we age is that we just have a lot of developmental rheostats and when we move those a little bit we move the dial. When we look at for example identical twins they're not really truly identical. They have the same genome but the developmental timing can alter the traits that we see ultimately. What do you still marvel at? What do you still, what are the gaps that you say that we're near, you know, real discovery and making a significant impact in the next few years? Well, I still marvel that we're here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the big one. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. I do. Uh, Talk more about that for a minute. When you say you still marvel that we're here, that this thing that life happens and yeah, can why, take place. If you watch a uh, video of embryo development, it's very difficult to identify that that's how we started. And so I marvel at the fact that an egg and a sperm come together. You can watch a video of embryo development, and that's us. So that's just something that... Uh, really is marvelous that I'm always in awe of. <clears throat> I think as a human embryologist, um, sometimes I search for um, what's acceptable. So what can we do? What shouldn't we do? Um, and there's a great respect for, for life. I've always looked at human embryo development as just simply almost miraculous. Mm -hmm. We emerge at the end of the movie. Now, um, I think that when I look at what we can do, I believe the most important th thing that we can do is begin to understand. Um, if, as we look at kind of what life is, we are born, we get diseases, and we die. And all of this seems to be somehow coded in our genome or coded in our development. We live a certain length of years. Dogs live a certain length of years. Mice. So we, each species has their own specifics. And how that is related to our DNA and our developmental progression is something that I think is the big question. And when you say, what shouldn't we do, are those some of the ethical dilemmas that you're thinking about? 
as a, I think as a human embryologist, I'm probably a conservative. So I have heard scientists some say, sometimes say, in order to get the answer, we should be able to genetically modify human embryos. We should be able to do uh, different types of experiments. And I'm a bit conservative. And most likely that conservatism really um, emerges from having been an embryologist. It's really a beautiful system, and I think we need to look at each step, what type of information might we get, how valuable is that information, and does it uh, merit certain types of experiments and certain procedures. And even for healthcare purposes, I think that's the big question in healthcare. Uh, the beginning of life and the end of, the end of life have enormous ethical considerations on what should be done and what shouldn't be done. I mean, uh, for what it's worth, not that I'm any, uh, an expert on it, I would prefer, like many people, not to have extraordinary means to uh, keep me alive. I'd like to die naturally. Um, and so, how do we allow uh, in vitro fertilization? How do we promote the uh, birth of a child? And then how do we also, at the end of life, really allow us to go out gracefully? One of the most interesting things, not to go on on this question too much, but one of the most interesting things to me was uh, I had a 93-year-old mother-in-law die. And one day uh, she said to me, you know, Renee, there's three things I want. I want to have money left when I die. I want to be able to go to the bathroom by myself. And I want to still be able to think. I said, oh, okay, those are three things. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. you, those are fundamental things. And you raise some really some deep questions about how do you educate you're a scientist. How right. do you bring the public along on these really fundamental issues right. of genetics, of embryo, of gestation, right. of when you intervene, right. how you intervene on end of life issues? As a scientist, how do you really, how do you think, are we doing a good job of bringing the public along? And yeah. what's the sort of the, the best way to enhance that? Um, I don't, you know, that's one of the toughest questions. When we're looking at moral and ethical issues, I think it becomes, uh, people tend to polarize, much like politics. There becomes a polarization based on belief. But my approach has always been to um, talk softly and try to love the person that has a different uh, opinion than me. They, uh, it's, I don't see that I know the answer. And I believe that that's something that perhaps we're missing a bit of today in that when we take these complex issues, sometimes people come out of the box and say that they know the answer for everyone. And I don't know that that can be the case. Um, certainly we have to have limits. But I think there's a need for more soft talking, more thoughtful discussion, and uh, caring about each other. So when I talk about wh whether how we begin and how we end, there's a, I would hope that there's a respect for um, you know, the organism, for our human uh, identity, but also for the great complexity of what the question is. Thank you.